We are starting a brand new series today called You've Got a Friend in Me. It's about relationships, about relationships and, and the different elements and aspects of relationships. We have relationships that are good, who has those, relationships that are bad, relationships that can be very ugly. And we'll talk about biblical views of relationships. We all need to make our relationships better. Who would agree with that? And we all need to work on them. If you're married, I want to say this. We have a, uh, like a one-day marriage conference that's going on here. It is for free. Everybody like free stuff. It is for free, uh, money-wise, but you're going to have to put in time and effort, time and effort into this. It is called Forever For Real. It goes, it's on, uh, on Saturday, September the 26th. Here's what I would say. I've seen the material. It's amazing. Kim and I are going to be teaching some sessions on it. It will help your marriage be stronger. If your marriage is, is a mess, you need to come. If your marriage is, is okay, but it needs to get better, you need to come. If you think your marriage is the best it's going to be, you are smoking something. Because, because your marriage, all marriages need work and can get better. They can really get better. So you can go out into the lobby, go out in the lobby, and uh, ap- not right now, after the service. Christina, wave your hand right there. It's Christina. She, she will get all your information. You go out there. She'll be at the info table. And you can sign up to be a part of that. We have limited spaces, like 10. We have space maybe for 10 couples that are left. It is limited, uh, the number of people that we can have. We already have 35, 40 couples signed up right around there. And so you'll want to go ahead and sign up for that. That will be amazing. Everybody grab your Bibles if you have them. Grab your Bibles if you got them. Today we're starting a brand new series called You've Got a Friend in Me. Throughout this series, we're going to be talking about relationships, about how do we do relationships the right way. From the Bible, what can we learn people messed up and did wrong? And so we will take a look at different aspects of relationships throughout this series. I would encourage you to continue to come back. Come back next week. Also, we are working on being, we're going we're gonna to make it happen to where when you come, the more times you come, that you will be eligible. We're going to do a drawing for a card for tacos for a year where you can go to their taco stand, which is at 41st and Garnett, uh, the best tacos, one of the best tacos in Tulsa, by the Tulsa world and by me. And because uh, literally I suffered for the Lord and went to every taco stand in Tulsa, and those are amazing. But we're going to work that out. The more you come, put in cards uh, just to say you were here. Bring more people. It, it's just awesome. So you won't miss that. Grab your Bibles if you have them. Today we are going to be talking about uh, our friendship with God, that God wants to be our friend. Jesus wants to be our friend and now, when I think about God, you know, many times I don't necessarily, my first thought isn't, oh, God is my friend. My first thought I put is God is the creator. I think of God as being big and powerful. I think of God as, as the creator. I think of God, you see it in scripture, as the judge. That God is going to, there's going to be a point of judgment and God is a judge. I think of God as a father figure. We see that, father God in scripture. The, the aspect of God's personality and relationship with us many times that is left off is that God wants to be a friend to us. See, God wants to be a friend of ours. Now, for me, that, that uh, had a roadblock between it for a long time because I saw God as God in heaven who is far off and distant. And many people, there's even a theology that believes this, that God created the universe and he made humanity. People believe there is a God and he made humanity, but after he made humanity, he stepped away and just let them live their own life and just hope you make it. <laughs> That's jacked up. It really is. I mean, it really is. What if we had a child? We had a little child, and as soon as the baby was able to to not even walk, we stepped away from our newborn baby and said, ah, hope you make it. That's jacked up. And so it's the same way with theology of thinking God doesn't want to be involved in in us and our relationship and and in everything that's going on and to have a relationship with us. Matter of fact, Jesus wants to be our friend. How many of that is an honor? That he would want to be our friend. He wants to be our savior, but he also wants to be our friend. If you have your Bibles, you can turn or you can look in your notes or even on the screen, Proverbs 18, verse 24. It says, a man of many companions may come to ruin. Now, what does that mean? A man of many companions may come. You know, if you try to please everybody, you're not going to please anybody. (laughs) People are like, well, I'm just going to be popular and please everybody. If you try to do that, if you try to have everybody be your friend and your really close friend, you're never really going to truly have friends. It says, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother in reference to Christ. See, God wants to be, Jesus wants to be a friend to us that is closer than blood. He wants to be a friend for us that's there all the time. Matter of fact, in John 15, Jesus said it like this, talking to his disciples. He says, there's no greater love than to lay down your life for one's friends. It says, you are my friends if you do what I command you to do. I no longer call you slaves because a master does not confide in his slaves. You are now my friends. Now think about this. He, he says, I don't want to call you slaves. I don't want you to be somebody who just does a list of do's and don'ts. 
See, what does religion tell us? Religion has a list of things we do and things we don't. And if we do these things and we don't do these things, then our relationship with God is good. God is not about a list of do's and don'ts. God is about relationship. Now, with relationship, there are things that he wants us to do. And there are things he doesn't want us to do. But that doesn't make our relationship. Our relationship, closeness to him, is what makes us want to do the right things and not do the wrong things. We get it mixed up. Well, if I do the right, don't do the wrong, then my relationship with God will be close. No, get your relationship to God close, and then he'll deal with your heart about not doing the wrong and doing the right. See, we get it mixed up so many times. See, God's not about the do's and the don'ts. God's about the heart. And the relationship that he wants to have. How honoring is that? That God wants to have a relationship with us. That he just wants to be with us and hang out with us and get to know us. Jesus said this. He said, now you are my friends since I have told you everything the Father told me. That is just cool. How many know that Jesus wants to tell you secrets? Matter of fact, in the book of Psalms it says, I will share secrets with you. God wants to have a relationship with us that's so close that he just talks to us. And he'll tell us stuff about our future, about different things, and he will just share stuff with us because he wants that relationship. He's looking for that relationship. He's longing for that relationship. It goes on and says, you didn't choose me. I chose you. You say, well, I gave my life to Christ. No, he chased you down. (laughs) Who was ever there? I mean, I was a screw-up. He chased me everywhere, and then finally I said yes. And I'm like, I said yes to you, Lord. He's like, I chased you down for a long time because I chose you. You're here today not by accident. You're here today because he chose you. That's an honor to be chosen. He goes on and says this, I appointed you to go and produce lasting fruit as that, uh, so that the Father may give you whatever you ask for using my name. God wants to give us fruit And God wants to answer our prayers. Who wants to answer prayers? Okay, the rest of you don't. Okay, how many of you want your prayers to be answered? You're like, I would like to pray and actually have God answer my prayers. What is the key to having God answer our prayers? The key to having God answer our prayers is relationship. That is the key. The closer we get to him, the more you'll see your prayers get answered. The more I have a relationship with God, the more my prayers get answered. One of the reasons I believe that is, is the closer I get to him, my prayer life changes. Instead of praying for the list of 10 things that I have to have, I have to have a new car, I have to have a new house, I have to have all this junk that I don't really need, my prayers start to change to reveal his heart, not mine, as I become his friend, as I become his friend. We're going to look at what does God look like as a friend? What does God look like as a friend? If you're taking notes, you can write this down. What does God look like as a friend? And the first one is this, God is a friend who will always, everybody say always, God is a friend who will always be with us. He will always be there. We go through stages in our life, don't we, where we have different set of friends. We have different set of friends that we, that we talk to and we see all the time. When you were in elementary school, you had different friends. Maybe junior high, they changed. High school, they changed. When you went on to work or to college, you had different friends. When you lived in a neighborhood, maybe you had friends in that neighborhood. But when you moved away, your friends changed. And they're still your friends, but you're not as, as involved in the relation. you know what I'm saying? Because you don't live so close. We had friends when we lived in Missouri. And they're still our friends, but we're not as close to them because we don't see them every week. You know? And so relationship, God says, I, I want to be a friend to you that's not there every once in a while. I will be a friend that is there all the time. Look at this, Hebrews chapter 13, it says, don't love money, don't, but be satisfied with what you have. How many times do we chase the wrong things? <laughs> we chase money, we chase stuff, we live our life chasing stuff. We live our life chasing stuff. And God says, you know what? Stuff isn't what matters. Stuff is just stuff. Stuff will break down. Stuff will disappear. Stuff, stuff, stuff won't really matter to us in a long, long time from now. What matters is relationships. And God says, don't go chasing stuff. For he said this, for I will never fail you. And I will never abandon you. So you can say with confidence this, the Lord is my helper. How many like to be able to say that? God has got my back. God has got my back because I'm not chasing stuff. I'm chasing him because I'm not concerned about everything else. I'm concerned about relationship with him. And I can say this, God has got my back because he is my friend. And he is someone who will be there. How many of you ever need like a two in the morning friend? (laughs) I mean, one of those people when you're going through hell in life and everything seems like it's falling apart and you get on your phone and you call everybody and nobody answers or you text a hundred people and nobody answers because they're all asleep. There is a friend who never sleeps. 
And all you have to do is call on him, and he wants to be the first one that we call because he wants relationship with us. See, God is always there. What is he going to say? It says, the Lord is my helper, so I will have no fear. What can mere people do to me? When we get to this place of relationship, we have this confidence that God is with us, and he has our back, and he has our front, and he has our sides, and he has our life, and he is our friend. Here's the deal. God is always there as a friend. God is there in the good times, and God is there in the bad. God is there when we have much, and God is there when we have nothing. God is there when we are going through joyful times, and he is there when we are going through pain. God is there in the morning. He's there in the night. Here is the truth. God is just there. And all we have to do is realize and cry out to him to to be our friend and that we are listening to his voice. So God is a friend that is always there. Maybe you've had friends that have hurt you. Maybe you have people in your life that have abandoned you, and you feel hurt, and you feel alone. Here's the truth. You make the choice to be alone. And here's just the fact. You are never alone. God is always one whisper away. And he will come and he will fill your life with more goodness than you could imagine. God is a friend. He is a friend who is always there. Here's another thought about God. God is a friend who will challenge you to be better. God is a friend who will challenge you. He will challenge you to be better. Go ahead and look at that verse in Ephesians chapter 1. Verse 18, it says, I pray that your hearts will be flooded with light. What's God say? The Apostle Paul saying this, I pray that, that light would shine in your hearts like crazy. And he says, so that you can understand the confident hope to which, to, to, given to those who he has called. Who has God called? Every single one of us in this room. <laughs> And God wants light just to flood our hearts, to flood our minds, to see that there's something inside of us. See, God's sitting there and saying, you're not called to live in darkness. You're called to raise above that. You know, so many times we set our expectations for ourselves where we get satisfied with living at this level, don't we? I will live at this level. And God says, oh, you're not supposed to live right there. I want you to be up here. I don't want you to live right there. I want you to live right here. And so what does God do? He gets in our life and he messes with our stuff. Who's ever had God mess with your stuff? What does that look like? I'll give you an example of what that looks like for me. He will mess with my stuff. Sometimes I will be selfish. And he will mess with my stuff. And he'll just start dealing with me, knocking at my heart whenever I'm selfish, saying, lay your life down or give something away or do something for somebody else. And I'm sitting there going, I don't want to. And he never quits knocking, messing with my stuff. Maybe there's someone in my life that I need to forgive, and I'm living at this level of every time I see them or I pray for them, I pray for God to strike them down. No one else would ever pray that. Lord, send snakes into their house. Do something horrible. And God messes with my stuff saying, why don't you pray for me to bless them? No, the snake prayer is better. No, you need to pray for them to bless them. Well, Lord, bless them with rattlesnakes. And and no, you need to pray for their life to be blessed. Well, Lord, I'm comfortable down here. And God says, no, move up. Move up. Or I'm like, Lord, I don't have time to serve. And God says, that's what you were created for. And he messes with our stuff. People cut me off and flip me off. And I want to... Tell them something. (laughs) And the Lord's been messing with my stuff, and he's like, just pray for them. I don't want to pray for them. He's like, don't live here, Tom. Live up here. See, whatever it looks like, God wants to mess with all of our stuff because he, he wants to challenge us to be who we're called to be. It goes on, it says, the confidence, hope that he's given you to those he has called, his holy people. Man, I feel sometimes like I'm left out of that one. But he doesn't want us to live here. He wants us to live here. He wants us to live a holy life. Now, I'm not talking about no makeup. Please wear makeup. (laughs) Or long hair or just, you know, what what we, no, here's what I would say. Some of the guys in here need to wear makeup. (gasps) Just kidding. I need to move up to a holy life. Yeah, I need to get some. Here we go. But no, God wants us to move, and he's dealing my heart right now. I shouldn't have said that. Um, <laughs> but he challenges us to live a holy life. Listen, there's some of us in this room that, that we're doing the wrong thing, and we know it's the wrong thing. Whether it's hate, or it's lust, or it's addiction. 
God will challenge us to move up to another level. Why does he do that? Look at the next one. This is really one point. I, I, I have it down as two because I wanted to impress you with all my stuff, but it's really one big point. And here's the deal. God will challenge us to be better. Why does he do that? Because God is a friend that sees greatness in us. See, God says don't live right here. Live up here. Why does he want us to do that? Because he sees something in us that other people may not see. When God looks at us, he sees greatness. He sees greatness. Jeremiah 29, 11 says this, For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Do you know God has plans for you? He has, it literally means this, For I know the plans that I am weaving together for you. God sees such greatness in us that he weaves a specific plan for each one of us that is perfectly fitted for us. He says, I know the plans that I have for you, says the Lord. Plans to prosper you. Sign me that for that and not to harm you. To give you a hope and a future. See, God says, don't live here, live here. God challenges us to make changes in our life as a friend. God's not the friend who sits on the sideline and lets you drive your life down a road of crud. He is the friend who says, get off that road. There's a better road. I sat down and talked to people, and, and I've talked to them, and, and I've sat there and said, you know, the, the way your life's going, not the best way for it to go. Would you agree with that? Well, yeah. Well, then why don't you change? Well, no, I can't do that. Well, why can't you? I just can't. Yes, you can. You can get your life off a road of misery to a, lo- a road of hope and, and a road of your destiny. Here's the deal. God sees greatness in us. I'm glad for that. He sees something in you. And maybe your whole life you've been told by people there's nothing good in you. Maybe you were told by your parents. Maybe you were told by teachers you weren't smart enough. Maybe you've been told by people at work that you don't have it. Here's the deal. God knows more than they do. Who would agree with that? And he sees greatness inside of you. God looks at you and says, I could take them and change the world. I could take them and I could make a difference. If they would just come in a relationship with me and be my friends. Listen, you don't have to be smart for God to use you because he's smart enough. And he can tell you stuff. I had a friend in high school. Dude was not very smart wasn't the smartest guy and I remember he came to know Christ just fell in love with Jesus now I wasn't saved I wasn't following God this guy fell in love with Jesus now he wasn't very smart before I remember sitting down and talking to him after he fell in love with Jesus he was quoting scriptures like crazy and I'm like this is the dude who could barely remember the alphabet I'm like you would talk to him and uh, and 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 literally I, I I was like this is so simplistic and he's sitting there telling me about Jesus quoting scripture after scripture after scripture and I was like this is not the same dude because he had a relationship with a God who knew it all see God can make you better he will make you smarter he will surround your life with favor who wants that and he will bless us see what the deal is he sees greatness in us. Look at this. Where does, how does that greatness come out? Ephesians 3.20, it says, God can do anything, you know. And we're like, hey, God, you can do anything. Just do it. Do it, Lord. Do it. You can do anything. How does he do it? Look at this. It says, far more than you could ever imagine or guess or question your wildest dreams. How does he do it? He does it not by pushing us around, but by working within us. His spirit deeply and gently within us. How does God get greatness out of us? He messes with our stuff. He doesn't just come and wave a wand and say, woo, it's all done. He messes with our heart. He messes with our stuff. He he challenges us. He challenges us to take crazy steps of faith to do something for him that will change the world and that will change our life. God is a friend. Everybody look up here. God is a friend who loves you and who believes in you. Some of you, your your life is in the middle of junk right now And God doesn't see the middle of the junk. God sees the potential that lives inside of you. And he wants to use your life to make a difference. You look at this. God is a friend who will challenge us to be better. He's a friend who sees great things in us. Here's the last thought is this. God is a friend that loves us and proves it. You know, people can say they love you. People can say they love you. They can can throw words around like, hey, I love you. Hey, I love you. Hey, I love you. And then the next day they treat you like trash. Because their love doesn't mean, their their words don't mean anything. I will say words, but words don't mean anything if words aren't backed backed up with actions. See, words aren't powerful unless they're backed up with actions. And when words are backed up with actions, that's when you can truly rely upon them. And God doesn't just say, I love you. God proves it. Look in Romans chapter 5, verse 7. It says, now most people would not be willing to die for an upright person. 
though someone might be willing to die for a, a person who is especially good. But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die while we were still sinners. Another version says God sent Christ to die while we were still his enemies. It wasn't that he was against us, but it was that we were against him. And God says, I love you. And we're like, blank you, God. And God says, I still love you. I love you so much that I sent my son to die for you. See, I'm not just saying I love you. I'm proving I love you. See, God doesn't just talk. Talk, 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 talk. God proves by acting it out. It goes on and says this, but God showed his great love for us by sending his son to die for us while we're still sinners. And, and since we have been made right in God's sight by the blood of Christ, he will certainly save us from God's condemnation. And it says, for since our friendship, everybody see that, our friendship with God was restored by what? By the death of his son. See, God says, I want to be friends with them. And he sent Jesus to die so that friendship could be solidified. He said, you wanna, I want to be their friends. I'm going to pay the price of all their junk and of all their sin. And he goes on and says this. It has been restored by the death of his son while, while we were still enemies. It will be, certainly be saved through the life of his son. See, God doesn't just say he loves us. I'm glad for that. He proves he loves us. And he proved it by sending Jesus. He says, I love you so much that I'm going to pay the price for every one of your sins, and I shall prove it. Now, many of us in this room, many of us in this room have had people tell us stuff before. People have told us things that, that they didn't follow through on. And maybe sometimes it's hard for us to, to, to really trust God because we have heard stories before of people saying something, and then they don't have the actions that go behind it. I know I know in my life I've experienced this. I've experienced, I've experienced someone saying something to me and telling me something and, and then the actions behind it weren't really there. They weren't really there. About nine months ago, uh, we were moving. Our family was moving. We, we had lived in a house out in the country for about 13 or 14 years. We lived out there for 13 or 14 years and, and we decided we we're going to move closer, move into town. And so if you've lived in a house for 13 or 14 years, I don't know if you know this, you accumulate a bunch of stuff. Who in here has ever moved? It is the most hideous thing ever. And we were moving, and we didn't just have a house full of stuff. We also, because we lived out in the country, we had a barn, a large building, like a 30 by 40 foot building that was full of stuff. And so in order to move, we had to get rid of stuff in our lives. And so I did not allow my wife to go out and get rid of the stuff because my wife is not good at getting rid of stuff. She is good at keeping stuff. If she sees some, if I would have put her in charge, we would have ended up with more stuff. And then I'm sitting there going, no, you don't need to go outside. What are you throwing away? Nothing, honey. Don't worry about it. Why do I see the trucks driving away with all of our stuff? You don't need to worry about it, babe. And so I, I was out and I would go through all the stuff. I would just go through all the stuff, box after box after box after box after box of stuff, and as I'm going through the boxes of stuff, just tons of boxes of stuff, you know, I'd go through boxes, and I would see, I would see stuff from my kids, you know, like when my older boys were little, I'd see like a toy they had played with, and I'd be like, I remember that, I remember when we had that toy, and just the memories would come flooding back, anybody ever been there, and you're like, I remember that toy when we were in Missouri, and I remember Austin and Cody playing with that toy in, in this room, in this house, and all of a sudden, it was like those, those memories came flooding back, or, or hey, I found something from a vacation or a trip we had taken, and I don't know why we bought it, but we did, and, and probably so the memories would flood back, so I would see it, and I was like, oh, I remember that time, we were there, and the memories would flood back, and then I would see stuff, and I was like, oh, I hate this memory, and I would throw it away, or I was like, this is just junk, why did my wife save a onesie that my kid threw up on? Why would you save that? And so I would throw some of those away, not a good memory, and I came upon this one box that I didn't know, all of our other boxes we were careful to mark. But we had this one box that was there, and it was behind all these other boxes, and I didn't know what was in it. And I just got the box, and I, and I cut the box open, and nobody else was there except me. It was near the end part of when we were moving. And I, I opened up the box, and as soon as I opened up, I realized it wasn't our box. It was a box that my mom had sent. Uh, I would went to her house to visit her, and she always says, take this stuff. It's yours. And I'm like, okay. And, 
I would just take it and I would hide it for my wife and uh, pack it away and no, hide it for my family or I just went and I didn't want to open it or deal with it and I just put it in the thing because I didn't want to open it or and so I put it in there and so I start going through all this stuff and I'm going through pictures of when I was in high school or I'm going through all these, I had baseball cards and I'm like, oh, this is awesome. Once again, living memories and then I got to the, I got to the bottom of the box and at the bottom of the box, there was this. Now this, um, this was my dad's lunchbox. My dad um, worked at a place called Flint Steel in Tulsa, Oklahoma. He worked in a steel factory, and every day he would go to, to, to work, and he would pack this lunchbox. On the, si- on the side, I guess my dad was a pretty bad dude, because on the side, his nickname was Killer. That was his nickname, Killer. That's pretty scary. And uh, that was his nickname from all the guys at the steel factory who are usually pretty bad dudes. If you get named Killer at a steel factory, you must be a pretty bad dude. And I, I saw this, um, this lunchbox, and as soon as I saw it, a wave of emotion just hit me. If you don't know the story of my dad, and some of you don't know all of it, I'll, I'll unfold it a little bit. My mom and dad got divorced when I was nine years old. The first nine years of my life, my dad lived in the same house with us, but he was never a dad to me. I remember what my dad would do is my dad would go to work, and and he would come home, and he would get cleaned up, and he would go to the bar, which in our town was called a beer joint because the bar was too fancy. <laughs> Anybody ever called a beer joint? It was called a beer joint in my hometown, and he went to the beer joint, and, and he would go there till late at night, every night. He would come home, get cleaned up, go to the beer joint, come home after we were, we were awake. Next day, same repeated thing. On Saturday, maybe he would get up and work a little bit around the house, mow the yard, go to the beer joint, stay the night, and that was his life, was going to the beer joint. Uh, I never had a relationship with my dad. Never once did my dad play catch with me in the yard. Never once did my dad play a game with me on the floor. Never once did my dad take me fishing or hunting or anything. The only interaction I had with my dad growing up was when my mom would take my older brother to events. Every once in a while, not very often, she would leave my dad in charge of me, and she would say to him before she would go, do not take him to the bar. Now, here's the deal. For anyone who knows my mom, she is a scary lady. She really is. She's 84. She still scares me. And I remember one time he did something. He took me to the bar one time. I remember this. He took me to the bar one time. We got home. I told my mom. My mom hit him in the side of the head with a cast iron skillet. I remember my dad laying there bleeding. And as she stood over him, she said, never take him to the bar again. He did not hear because he was unconscious. So needless to say, I never went to the bar again with my dad. But he would take me and buy beer. So we would go into town, and he would take me to buy beer, and then he would drive home, and, and he would drink the beer. He, and he would tell me the whole time, you cannot tell your mom I'm buying this beer. If you don't tell your mom I'm buying the beer, I'll buy you a candy bar. And I'm like, buy me two. <laughs> so I became a negotiator at a young age. He would always buy me two. I would never tell my mom. And that was the only interaction was just driving in the car with him. And I remember at four years of age, he handed me a beer, and he said, it's time for you to be a man. Drink a beer. I started drinking at the age of four. Later on in my life, I had a problem with alcohol. I wonder why. Uh, but at the age of four, he, he handed me a beer and told me to be a man and drink a beer. And so my relationship with my dad was very non-existent. It was very non-existent. I remember, I remember the day my mom and dad got divorced. I remember him driving down this gravel road that w- our house was on in a beige vega. And I remember as I saw the car drive away and there was dust from the road, I remember this. I remember not being sad. I hear stories of kids who say, yeah, I, I was sad when my dad left. I wasn't sad when my dad left. I remember when my dad left. I remember the feeling. I remember as a nine-year-old kid. But nine-year-old kid, I remember the feeling of relief as my dad drove away because I thought my life will not, no longer be as crazy as it was. I had never had a dad in my life even though he was there. Two weeks after he left and they got divorced, my dad called my house. My mom answered the phone. He asked to talk to me because he wanted to take me to a movie. Nine years old, he wants to take me to a movie. I didn't really want to have much to do with my dad, but I really wanted to go to a movie. Growing up, we never went to movies. We didn't have any money. I went to one movie up until that time. I went and saw Where the Red Fern Grows. Horrible movie to take your kid to. Horrible. In case you've never seen it, don't watch it. The dogs die. 
I remember being like six years old. I'm like, the dogs are dead. And my mom's like, but there's a fern growing between them. Who cares about the fern? The dogs are dead. I don't want a fern. I want a dog. But for some reason, I wanted to go with my dad to a movie. And he goes, come to a movie. We'll go out to eat. You can stay the night at my house. And I'm like, yeah, because I wanted to go to a movie. And, and he picked me up. Now, now, picking me up didn't mean he came and knocked on my door. My mom told him. She said, when you pick him up, you come in the driveway. You honk the horn. You do not get out the car, or I will shoot you. And she would have shot him. I mean, literally, she would have shot him. And so we came, honked the horn. I went and got in the car. As soon as I got in the car, he's like, hey, let's go grab it. Let's go get something to eat. We went out to eat. It was, it was cool. We didn't really talk much. And then we went to a movie. And we went to the movie. I'd never really been to the movie. He bought me popcorn. Woo! And a pop. And I sat there and I watched the movie. We went to his house that night. I slept on his couch in his nasty little apartment. And he took me home the next day. And I remember as we're driving home the next day, I remember... This glimmer of hope that maybe I will have a dad. Went two weeks, he didn't call. After two weeks, he called again. And he said, I want to take Tom out again. And my mom was like, it's up to him. And I said, yes, I want to go. And he came and picked me up and went out again. Same thing. We didn't talk very much. But, but once again, that glimmer of hope went from small to bigger. That my dad might actually care about. Two weeks later, he called again, and I said, yes. He came up, and I went, and I got in the car. And I remember as I walked to the car, and I opened up the door of the beige wagon. As soon as I sat down, I knew what was going on because I could smell the alcohol. And with my dad, whenever he drank, he wasn't, he wasn't mean, and he wasn't abusive. He was just loud and obnoxious and stupid. He was like, how are you doing? And I'm like, oh, he's drunk. An experience that I'd seen my whole life. But my mom had told me if he is drinking or at any time drinks, you let me know. You're not allowed to go with him. But I got in the car, and I knew he was drunk, and my mom's words popped into my brain. And immediately, immediately I said, I'm not going to tell her because maybe he, maybe he will actually be a dad to me. And we went, and we went out to eat, and he was loud. And we went to the movie. I remember the movie. We saw Rocky II. And as we're watching the movie, he was still drinking. He had brought alcohol in, and he's drinking the whole time. He's just, he's just lit. And he's drinking the whole time. And anytime Rocky would fight, anytime there was a fight scene, he would, he would stand up in the movie theater. He was like, come on, Rocky! And he would just start cussing. And, you know, Rocky, whip him, blankety blank. And, and, you know, I'm just sitting there. I'm nine years old, and I'm embarrassed beyond belief, and I'm sliding down in my chair, and, and he's yelling. Everybody's like, sit down and shut up. He's like, you shut up. And, and I'm like, okay, I can't do this anymore. And I'm like, I have got to leave because he's getking drunker and drunker. And I remember I went out to the lobby, and I asked the manager to use a phone, a landline, something, you know, archaic, and where you actually had to, you know, didn't have cell phones, and I did a thing called placing a collect call, which means my mom had to pay for it, which made her not happy too. And I called her, and I was like, Mom, Dad is drunk. And she was like, what? And I was like, he is drunk. And she's like, I will be there to pick you up. And I went back in. The movie was over. We walked out. And we walked out, got outside. I said, I said Mom's here to pick me up, Dad. And he didn't care because he was drunk. And so I went, and I got in the car with her. And she said, you'll never go with him again. I'm like, he just made a mistake, Mom. He's my dad. A few days later, I heard him talking on the phone. And it ends up that my dad really did not want a relationship with me. What happened was he was trying to win my mom back. And what he had done is he thought if I could win Tom, then I could win her. And on that phone conversation, I heard it all. And my nine-year-old glimmer of hope went to nothing. Now, what I do with hurt is I put hurt in a box and I pack it away. Anybody else? I put hurt in a box and I compartmentalize that hurt. And I'm like, this hurt will stay here. And I won't think about that hurt. And I'm not the kind of person who will relive it over and over again. It stays in the box. And that's where it stays. And then all of a sudden, and all of a sudden, and all of a sudden, as I'm packing to move my wonderful family that God has given me, I open up a box and it opens up a bigger box than I could ever imagine. And I'm sitting there looking at this thing, and I'm thinking I'm throwing it in the trash. 
Because then I can throw away all the hurt and all the pain and all the emptiness and all the lies and I can just throw it away and then I'm done with it because I will never have to see that again. And I, I literally, because my prayer life with God is just talking. And I'm sitting there and I'm like, God, I'm throwing this piece of crap away. And I said piece of crap to God and he was not offended. How do I know? Because immediately he spoke back to me and he goes, Tom, I don't want you to throw that away. I'm like, why would you not want me to throw that away? And he said, instead of looking at, uh, looking at that and seeing the hurt and the pain of what your dad did to you, I want you to see the restoration of what I have done for you. He said, Tom, every ball game your dad wasn't at, I was there. When you graduated and you were valedictorian and you gave a speech and you invited him to come and he didn't show up, guess what? I was there. <laughs> every time you were hurt, every time you felt empty, every time you were alone, every time you went out and partied because you were empty on the inside, I was there. You just, not, you just didn't realize it because you had not yet opened up your heart. But in that moment, Tom, when you opened up your heart, everything that you had missed, Every hurt that you had felt. Every piece of emptiness inside your heart and inside your life. I filled it all. He said, this is now a memorial to my goodness in your life. That what was missing, I am the one who can fill. I want everybody all across the room to close your eyes right now, all around the room. There are many of you in this room and you have emptiness in your life. Maybe people have hurt you. People have done you wrong. Maybe people have, maybe people have just have not been there. Maybe you're like me. I can't tell you how many people after service have come to me and said, your story is my story. I didn't have a dad. I didn't have this. I, maybe my, as people, my dad was there, but he was never there. And my, my solution to that is don't look at the emptiness of what someone left in your life. Look at the fullness that Christ can bring. And God's here today. He is here in the midst of us. And he is saying, I want a relationship with you. And I'm not just talking. I've already proven it by sending my son to die for you. I want to pray right now all across the room. If you are here today and your heart's not right with Christ, if you're here today and you've never surrendered your life to Christ, or maybe you're here today and, and at one time you did but you've fallen away and you've gone your own direction and you feel emptiness on the inside because you are not following Him. You're not living for Him. Some of you in this room, you know God has a plan and a purpose for your life, but you have purposely chosen to go the opposite way and God is calling you back today. And He says, I want to heal your hearts. I want to show you love. And I want to challenge you to greatness. All across the room, you say, Tom, that's me. My life is not right with God. My heart is not right with Him. Never has been, or maybe it was that I've fallen away. But today, I want, I want the emptiness filled with joy. And I want God to do something in my life. Today, I surrender. All across the room, you say, Tom, that's me. My life isn't right. My heart, hands are already going. My heart is not right. But I want it to be, and I need it to be. Pray for me. Pray with me. If that's you right now, just lift up your hands all around the room. Lift them up high. Lift them up high. All across, lift them up high. God bless you, young man. God bless you, and God bless you, and God bless you. Look up here as I, as I, as I, God bless you, and you, and you, and you, and you. God bless you, and you. God bless you, young man. God bless you, ma'am. God bless you. 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 Right over there. Good plans. God bless you. Look at me, sir. God bless you. He's got plans for your life. God bless you, and you. God bless you. Right over there. God bless you. Right over here. Right over there. Anybody else? You said that's me. Right back there, sir. Right over there, sir. Good plans. Some of you, so you know what? Some of you are like me. God bless you right back there. Some of you are like me. You're like, I'm not doing this. I'm not doing this. I'm not doing this. I'm keeping the box over there. The box will open sometime. Open in the presence of God and let Him bring healing. Anybody else? That's me. My life. God, I surrender to you right now. One more second. All across the room. God bless you. Okay. I'm going to lead us in a prayer. I want everybody in the room to pray with me from your heart, just talking to God, and we're going to watch him do something amazing in our lives. Everybody in the room, pray with me. Jesus, let's all pray together. Jesus, thank you for loving me so much that you laid down your life. 
you didn't just say you loved me, but you proved it. And right now, I give you my heart, and I give you my life, and I give you my future, and my everything. And I ask you to touch me, and to change me, and to help me live for you. Help me fulfill your purpose. From this moment on, my life is not my life. My life is yours. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's give God praise all around the room. Lord, we thank you, God. Lord, we thank you.